Hey, welcome back to Comic Book News. I'm Dan Shaheen, or as we say it in Krakoan, ah, ga, 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 ga. today we're going to take a look at Excalibur number one, the latest in the dawn of X, the all new relaunch of uh, the various related X Men titles, and how do they tie into this new paradigm, and this new day, and this new age, and this dawn of X? Let's find out today on Comic Book News. <laughs> Welcome back to Comic Book News. Today we're going to talk about a little something called uh, Excalibur Number One. It's written by Teeny Howard, art by Marcus Toe, and color art by Eric Arsenega. You know, sometimes I don't mention the colorist, and I think that's uh, a mistake, especially in this day and age where the work that the colorist does actually is a lot of the work that used to be done by the inker. In fact, many art teams today. Uh, forgo ink altogether go from their pencils straight into scans and then directly to color artwork which is pretty amazing so anyway let's not give short shrift to those colorists because uh, they're an increasingly important part of the modern look of comics so Excalibur number one um well let's back it up a second Excalibur right remember the Excalibur series in the late 80s Chris Claremont Alan Davis Right, as a kid, it was a spin-off of X-Men, but it was really weird. It had all these characters that I didn't really see, hadn't really seen before, hadn't heard of before, but they seemed to be coming from like this fully realized universe and set of characters um, set in, 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 in the UK, but in the Marvel Universe, right? And of course, this was all the Marvel UK stuff um, that was originally written um, by my favorite writer, Alan Moore, and art by Alan Davis. They first worked together on Miracle Man, and then later on, some of their early work for Marvel was at Marvel UK working on Captain Britain, right? You hire a British team, you put them on Captain Britain, let's see what these guys can do. Anyway, the character designs, especially of some of the villains, and, and, and the whole idea of this other world, this extra dimensional version of Avalon, which is the source of Captain Britain's powers, right? Where his uh, sort of magical powers come from are uh, from this land of Avalon and that ha features heavily in the new Excalibur series so uh, let's stop talking about it let's start looking in the million dollar comic scam hello oh a brand new look to the million dollar comics cam and today uh, a little special treat besides uh, Excalibur number one we'll also take a look at some of that Captain Britain work I've got this Captain Britain uh, legacy of a legend and we'll take a quick look at that today. First, Excalibur. Um, uh, we open to <clears throat> one of our text pieces, and this one is sort of uh, poetry. All right, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna spare you. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. But really, what this Excalibur series is looking like to me, it's a continuing in a series of themes of the new X-Men um, society versus. X, if you will. So, for instance, X Men itself is sort of humanity, X Men versus humanity slash um, society, right? That's no, that's marauders, right? Because they're going against the rules of society and sovereign nations, and and they're it's high piracy on the high seas. So that's against like society and law. Uh, X Men versus technology has been sort of this main thing. You might say X Men versus humanity. But it's really humanity in partnership with technology and subverting nature to become these uh, transhumans that uh, we're trying to avoid, right, for the extinction of um, uh, the mutant race. And, of course, this in this series, we're going to deal with X-Men and Krakoa and their relationship to magic in the Marvel Universe. So um, with that, we, we start off in the other world. Camelot in the other world, the Kingdom of Camelot, right? This is King Arthur. This is Morgan Le Fay uh, stuff, right? In, in this uh, day and age, if you will, in other world, Morgan Le Fay has complete control over Camelot uh, and is up to no good, as you can imagine. Um, basically, she's seen that this like scrying pool. There's something growing in the scrying pool, some kind of flowers or something, um, and that's our setup for. Uh, they feel like there's some sort of incursion from the human realm uh, into into 
Otherworld slash Avalon. Um, rather slash uh, Camelot. Uh, next, we get to see another text piece. This is they've been doing on all the new series, sort of setting us up with the key players. I don't know if this is good or not, because there's a lot of players you see in this series, but you don't know who's going to join this team or be involved really until the end. Um, and this sort of spoils a little of that, but whatever. The team Betsy Braddock, that's um, the original Psylocke, right? The Caucasian sister of uh, Brian Braddock, Captain Britain. Uh, we've got Rogue, an old favorite in the X-Men, and Gambit, of course. They're going to be together. we got uh, Jubilee. We've got uh, Apocalypse. We've got Trinary, who is sort of a new character to me that I haven't seen a lot of, but apparently uh, she's from India, and she's got technopathy, right? She can, can like control technology, which is not really made clear in this issue at all. I had to research that. And then, of course, Brian Braddock, who we know today as Captain Britain. And here we are in Excalibur, uh, issue one, verse one, the accolade of Betsy Braddock. So uh, we start in England and the Braddock sort of establishing um, that Brian is married to Megan, who, who actually probably should have been one of those characters mentioned, right? She's a key player in Excalibur. She's sort of a magical, shape-shifting, empathic fairy type, as I recall. Um, anyway, uh, this is Betsy Braddock about to depart... Um, Braddock Manor to head to Krakoa to answer the call of the mutants, right? All the mutants um, are heading out there. And uh, so she's going to join them. So here she is. She, she she heads out to the island where, man, it's barefoot hippie hangouts. Uh, An apocalypse, sort of like overlooking things like, like Big Daddy A, right? As a matter of fact, his name is no longer Apocalypse. His name is now this right which if if you haven't seen it before is a character we haven't seen before so it's sort of like a one character name we're just gonna call him ah. all right let's just say it's pronounced ah for now anyway so uh ah has a little bit of uh, interaction with trinary and we can see gambit's got some sort of like he's voicing some concern about apocalypse not a great guy to hang out with and what they're noticing is they've got a gateway that's formed here on Apocalypse that they cannot get through. It's a gateway from somewhere, but they cannot get into where that gateway goes to. Um, and so uh, they decide they will need a champion to breach that wall. All right, cut to uh, some uh, another um, text piece from the Krakoan Grimoires. Uh, and, and more stuff about magic, uh, a lot of stuff about like now instead of a circle in magic, we're going to use an X because for a circle, you need a bunch of points on a line and for an X, you only need four points. Well, truth be told for a circle, you really only need one point and like, um, the diameter or the radius, well, well I'm not going to go there. Uh, it, more musings on the X-Men's relationship to magic, essentially. And anyway, straight into magic, we go to a coven uh, in North Yorkshire where uh, these Brits, who I think are characters we've never seen before, um, are sort of uh, ghostbusters, occult-type ghost hunters, whatever, stumble across Morgan Le Fay, who basically uh, conscripts them and is like, you know, you're going to do my bidding now or it's, or, you know, it's curtains for you. Um... But back to Krakoa, where we see Jubilee, I guess, has a child now, has a baby now. This is something new. I'm not sure where that came from. Seems a little bit young to me, but, you know, these Krakoan... Uh, Krakoa doesn't have the same set of morals and values as human society, so you better just give that up, old man. Um, anyway, we learn that uh, uh, Fabio previously known as gold balls is now just known as egg right his power was to create these weird gold balls created by bendis for, for ne never given any reason for those balls turns out the balls are eggs that you can clone mutants into okay whatever seems a little contrived but um all righty uh next we see that the latest to be resurrected by one of these eggs is none other than jamie braddock 
Now, it is not explained why, other than that he's a mutant, I guess. But, I mean, this guy, besides being having ultra-powerful reality-warping abilities, you know, has been nothing but trouble in the past. He's, I mean, granted, we're giving amnesty to villains and stuff, but this guy was mentally ill. He thought that the world around him was all existing in a dream in his head, and his reality-warping powers were used to, uh, 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 you know, warp reality into his own twisted sort of mental world. And as we see here, he's still, like, not a nice guy. His sister really is, like, not too pleased with him coming back he's still got powers but they don't spell out they don't talk about his powers or his history really at all they just sort of introduce him and you know i was looking it up on uh wikipedia and uh according to that you know he has his reality warping powers immense in scope limited only by his imagination and fluctuating sanity he can create portals out of ordinary objects and can tra that can transport him across the planet or into other dimensions instantaneously. Transform living beings into entirely different forms, grant others various superhuman abilities, though they tend to fade over time, and can even resurrect the dead. Uh, quote from Psylocke, Power runs deep in our family. He got the full measure, the ability to pull the quantum strings that define causality. He got himself, himself so tangled, he'll never twist free. So clearly... This is an important character tied directly to our main characters. And um, while he doesn't do too much more in this issue, I, uh, I'll have some speculation on where um, he'll be coming into play. And of course, he was created originally and all that reality warping stuff was created by Alan Moore. And we'll, we'll look at the Captain Britain comics maybe at the end here. So anyway, Psylocke is uh, uh, not too pleased with that scenario, but whatever. Uh, she's going to go um, with her brother to try to uh, bridge the gap to Avalon, right? Like they can, they uh, since they have these magical abilities and they have the magical amulet that gives Captain Britain their powers, the theory is that that's going to allow them to travel to Av that That's how they can travel to Avalon without using the gate, right? So, oh, now it's revealed the X-Men have all new Krakoan costume technologies. So their costumes just, can just sort of like appear and disappear. Oh, uh, okay. It's kind of a riff on... Um, unstable molecules and and uh i believe the elementals used to have ectoplasmic costumes that could be repaired would repair themselves and stuff but okay yet another amazing ability of krakoa i mean you can't die so why should you be able to even tear your costume right okay um back to avalon where immediately it's established they didn't know morgan Le Fay was in charge she's got sway over captain britain she's gonna use it she's got those uh ghost hunter types or whatever uh, here as her acolytes cut back to the island and to, to rogue and gambit and they're sitting around being romantic talking about getting a house in the in the bayou sherry they're, they found a little bayou in the middle of the island um, okay and then she starts talking about uh, oh mate how about making more mutants um, you know maybe having a baby implying right and so that's where it's left Maybe we can see where this is going. This is what all those X-Men Rogue Gambit fans want. They just want them to be happy and marry each other and have kids. Oh, meanwhile, back at the a party, I forgot to mention, one of the coolest things Apocalypse says is he goes, man, this is it's just partying now. Like the, where, where before it was mutant suffering, now we're dancing in the streets and they're partying and that the, the, the children made in the couplings that happen tonight will be the most powerful generation of mutants ever. Uh, second generation mutants or whatever and raised in total freedom and loving who they are as mutants and everything else touching sentiment let you see Re apocalypse you know if you flip his angle that he really does maybe want the best at least for his people for mutants uh anyhow uh, he's still uh, insisting people call him ah, 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 ah. and uh they start to actually in this book so anyway, conscripts uh, 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 Rogue and Gambit again, and is like, um, uh, we need we need Rogue to somehow like abs It's not really clear. Use her powers to absorb something from the gate. It's really unclear. I couldn't re quite understand what they're trying to get at. It's all just a setup and a plot device, really, to get us to a certain point, I think. We'll see. 
Um, anyway, back to Betsy Braddock, who now went back when she was Psylocke, she never had these psychic sword abilities like her Asian counterpart did. So now she's got um, that ability too, and she uses them in instead of in like a an Asian style sword, she uses more like British style swords, I guess. Okay, whatever. So Morgan Le Fay very quickly takes over Bri uh, Brian Braddock. Like, she's got control. She controls Avalon. She's got magic. Captain Britain is magic, I guess. And so somehow is able to, like, control him and order him immediately to um, kill Betsy, right? And he's like, no. And he, but it, it, he's resisting, but he has to do what she says. But he passes the amulet to him, say, to her saying, implying that like Morgan Le Fay now is powering him so he doesn't need the amulet anymore. Again, not super clear storytelling or why or why that makes sense, but it's for an obvious reason that we're going to see. Now Apocalypse is like uh uh contacting them psychically, but he's at the limits of his abilities. He says you need to we need psychic power to rupture the gate from the inside. Um which they do, which she does. Uh, so which which hits destroys the gate. Nobody's coming through either way now. And Rogue is somehow what she was absorbing something we don't know. There's the the flowers that were growing in Krakoa, and now that sort of grabbed her. And now what? This may I, it's really unclear what happened, except you can sort of see she's now in like a coma. Or is she like Sleeping Beauty who's waiting for her handsome prince with a Cajun accent to rescue her? Blech. That's the right word for this. Um, anyway, she's got the amulet now though. She grabs the amulet and uh, you know he, he forces her to put the amulet on and sort of she escapes back. Now we've got Sleeping Beauty Rogue and Gambit's pissed at Apocalypse, but Apocalypse like, whatever, Gambit. Um, and boom, here we go. Betsy Braddock is now the new Captain Britain. This was all just a contrivance to get her set up as a new Captain Britain. Um, she's back uh, in Krakoa with Sleeping Beauty Rogue. And obviously we're going to go for an Avalon fairy tale kind of thing going forward. Um, cut to an epilogue, which I kind of liked. The coven, the leader of that coven of, of, of people, the only one who really had any talk, who said anything or did anything, just killed them all, killed the rest of them. She's like, you know, I think that's what would be best if you were just gone. I'm just going to usurp. Um, and of course, that's good. Morgan Le Fay likes that and welcomes her in to this coven, Akaba. Right, so an even deeper, darker coven. She's like, I'm sick of being the leader. I want to submit myself and become a member of something. And now she's a member. Um, next, Invocation of the Gods. More magical stuff. Um, basically stating the gist of this here is that, look, mutants think they're too good for magic, right? They think they're homo superior. And uh, it's, it's, our, it's humanity's lack of that superior gene that lets us um, be humble enough or whatever to commune with the dark forces of magic. Um, and, 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 and that's what's going on here. Um, next. Uh, so here we get to see all of Krakoa's For All Mutants. Um, this was Excalibur number one, where we are. The next one's X New Mutants number one. I'm very much looking forward to that one by, uh, uh, well, I was because I heard it was written by um, Hickman himself, but I heard now there's been a creative team change, so we'll have to see. So far, n neither of the Dawn of X titles that I've read so far has really blown me away. Um, but let's check out, what's, let's see what's going to happen next time. And of course, this says uh, next the great flame blazing okay so that was uh excalibur number one um let's quickly just i want to look at this captain britain stuff because this is definitely worth looking at 
besides being Alan Davis work, e early Alan Davis work, but even early Alan Davis work is beautiful stuff. Really great designs. It gives you all the background stuff. This goes all the way back even into their early work on the Black Knight and 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 and, and early Captain Britain stuff as well. This book ostensibly is more about Captain Britain, but the really great stuff is the Alan Moore, Alan Davis um, Captain Britain stuff in the back. Man, which led to so many great things in Excalibur and X-Men and just Marvel continuity. And now here it is back again. So that's pretty awesome. Um, so I got mixed feelings on, um, on Excalibur number one. Uh, I feel like the setup was a little ham-fisted, right? When we're, getting, we're setting up a fairy tale. It's going to be a fairy tale romance. Um, that seemed some of the events that led us to there seemed very contrived the artwork was serviceable um nothing that blew me away not a single image that really knocked me out um uh there were some deficiencies as far as like what i felt we needed to know a little bit more context I, if you're coming into this book not knowing anything not knowing the context of what that jamie braddock is all about like how would you know without doing some research or watching this channel that's how you'd know um, speaking of which, we've got a lot of new people watching this channel. We've got a lot of eyes on us, and we've been growing and growing thanks to you. So if you're not already, make sure you hit subscribe. Uh, if you want to get notifications when I drop new videos, hit that little bell thing. And most importantly of all, if you've got comments about what I've got to say, be them good or bad or indifferent, I want to hear them. Please write some stuff in the comments. I read and every comment and I respond to most of them uh, and I'm loving it. that's my favorite part of having this channel uh, besides getting to talk about comics with you so thanks and we'll see you next time